So we are doing a little joint podcast slash conversation today. Um, I'm Vicky from Social Work Sorted, the podcast. I'm uh, Alice, um, loving, but I oh God, do a number of different things, but I've done a PhD in social work. Um, I have expertise in attachment, parenting intervention, trauma, mentalization, and I try and bring that teaching as much as possible into social work practice through training and um, working with families as well. This is like a side thing, but do you introduce yourself as doctor or do you, uh, or do you not? So sometimes I do sometimes I don't I kind of just decide on the day what I feel like but seeing as in line with some of your questions I reckon I probably should yeah say yes I am I am Dr Alice Loving yes <laughs> I always think it's interesting so I'm like god you've worked so hard for that um qualification yeah and then but sometimes you don't be like oh I'm a doctor but then sometimes no. it's helpful and there's like a hierarchy isn't there in terms of how we perceive different professions yeah and I don't ever put it on any sort of like um a document that's like airplane related because if someone were to come to me and go oh we need you Dr Loving we need you I'd be like I'm, I'm an academic doctor I haven't got any medical training sorry and I've like wasted I never thought time. about that yes no exactly that that's actually happened to one of my friends so I will not go down that path and be responsible for um, anybody in that capacity oh, I hadn't thought about that yeah I think it's interesting because I sometimes I'm like would I be prouder to say what I did if I had like a doctor title before my name then I think quite a lot of the time social workers aren't necessarily proud to say I'm a social worker which I guess is why your podcast is really important because it's all about social work successes but yeah, yeah it's not necessarily a professional title I'm that comes with with a lot of pride I know but it absolutely should be a hundred percent and I think I spoke to, I did another podcast with someone in the US and social worker is a little bit more not protected but it's it's a bit more respected I think over there but they also like you can be a social worker and a therapist and it's all yeah yeah and often they do have that combined training I found that um which is great I think it kind of gives them a lot more um ownership of being able to do lots of different things within the role so yeah, yeah I've, I've noticed that as well so that's my tangent but for people who are listening or watching who haven't followed your work or who are new to your work do you want to give a little bit of an introduction to you your career journey and what's led you down the path that you've been on Okay, so I initially did a degree in um, education and psychology, and I thought, oh, I maybe want to become an educational psychologist. Um, but the more I got into that course, I actually felt like, although I now know that the job of an educational psychologist covers both, I was I became really interested in behaviours that were associated with um, more kind of attachment trauma than an organic kind of reason behind it. So that led me to think, actually, maybe I want to go down the psychotherapy route. So um, I left uni and I applied. Oh, I started looking at courses to train as a child, ad child and adolescent psychotherapist. Um, and they were basically like, you're 21, you know nothing about the world. Um, go and get some life experience and then come back to us. So I went to um, work as a family support worker in a child protection team. Um, and that was some serious life experience. <laughs> um, so, and I loved it. I, I just really, really loved it. I found that I could bring a lot of my learning that I've been doing around attachment really from kind of like 18 years old through to my degree. I felt like I could use it with the families. I could apply it with the families. Um, I had flexibility because obviously as, as a family support worker that you've got your the roles are quite different to social yeah. work and you do sometimes have a bit more freedom and a bit more creativity um, and probably a bit less admin um, so that allowed that and it was I, I honestly really loved it and during that time I attended some training on attachment and I met um, David Shemmings who was my PhD supervisor and he was like you seem really into this topic why don't you come and do a PhD and I was like, no, David, I've got a plan. I'm I'm on a journey. I'm going to be a psychotherapist. And he was like, well, how about you just put that on hold? Because you could always go back to that and you come and do this 
this you you try and do this PhD with me and I was like oh god like the thought of going back into doing anything academic I just dreaded it and also the journey of a PhD is long and lonely and I was like I don't know if I've got the the commitment for it I'd had the passion I just wasn't sure I could commit to it in the way that I needed to anyway in the end I thought you know what I'm just going to start it if I, if I, if it all doesn't work out then that's fine I've got some backup plans um so I did it I started it and it took five years um mainly because of the recruitment of my participant group I basically recruited parents who were in the process of a kind of a, um, three month assessment through court um proceedings in their in either foster placements um uh and um residential units and I realized why it's so hard to actually recruit those parents because um very rarely does research manage to and focus on them and hear from them and um because it's a really chaotic time and the last thing they really want to do is be involved in um in a piece of research but I was so lucky I got 17 it took me about two years to to recruit and, and do that piece of work but anyway in the end I did it the passion that I had, the, I carried on working within the field. So I carried on doing um, training, but also pieces of assessment work and um, intervention, video-based intervention with family. So that kept my passion going at the same time. I don't think I could have done it full time and just locked myself in a library that never would yeah. have worked. Um, so yeah, so I did it. I managed it. I got it. Um, and uh, and quite soon after that, I had my daughter daughter I actually had her at my graduation she was about six weeks old this college dreaming baby so I didn't really enjoy it in the way I was supposed to um but yes and then since then I have um tried to use that research in my teaching I got a lecturing post um for the Centre for Child Protection at Kent on their master's which is an online course which is absolutely brilliant I'd highly recommend that if anyone's thinking of um doing a master's and you could do that alongside working it's a challenge but it's possible um so yeah so I, I have continued to use that and I feel like there's lots of other things I want to be doing I want to be doing some more research um I want to make a documentary um I'm starting my podcast um I'm still doing work my own work with families and I'm still delivering kind of teaching and and training so it's not a straightforward answer I'm I'm in very much bits and pieces person that's a good thing it's never a bad thing to be in bits and pieces so for you, with everything that you have learned and know about attachment, for newly qualified social workers listening, because the people that listen to this are predominantly newly qualified or student social workers, what is one thing that you would want them to know about attachment? Well, it's impossible for me to do one. So I'm afraid I have got two. That's um, so the first one is that please avoid using it out of fear of getting it wrong. Because I think that is the most common thing I come across. People want to know more, they want to use it more, but they're so terrified of getting it wrong that they don't kind of start that journey of learning around it and putting it into practice. And yeah, I think that comes from lots of various different reasons. And I really wish that actually degree courses covered this in a lot more detail than they do. Um, because it seems mad to me that they don't. And whenever I do training, I always ask, you know, what 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 learning have people had on it? And it really varies. It's like a postcode lottery of universities. Some will spend a whole module, some will spend part of a module, some will only spend like a day on it. Um, so yeah, so the first thing is don't have a fear of using it. Just it it, it just requires you to almost do that extra work because it's not something that's just ingrained in the in the foundation of the of the course um then the next thing I was I was actually going to make a post about this on my Instagram the 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 biggest mistake that I see um is that people um sometimes will um start labeling uh, attachment behavior so they will say oh I think this child has an avoidance style or I think this child has an ambivalent style now it's really important that we never ever do that unless we are fully fully qualified even I can't do that in order to do that you have to go on like intensive training you have to like code a number of different transcripts and you have to get you have to be like an approved 
um, approved person to do that. So that would be my main thing. Once somebody does start exploring the learning around this, um, just be really cautious at making sure that you don't, you know, go into it saying, sort of analysing and giving someone a particular style. However, you can definitely use your observational skills to talk about if you are seeing avoidant behaviours, if you're seeing ambivalent behaviours in that relationship. And obviously doing a little bit more learning about that, you can clearly understand and, and know a bit more about what that what that looks like. But it totally is your job to comment on what you're seeing and observing. So we can that's why this is such a brilliant framework um, to, to, to use. And I, I don't I don't know why it's not more of a foundation, but it's my mission, Vicky, to make it that way. Yeah. I think I think it's that you, you picked up there, it's a lot of the fear. And I remember I was really lucky. So I went, I think when I was a newly qualified social worker in my ASYE, I had like a two day training with David Shemins, which really stuck with me because my takeaway from it was you can still talk about stuff. You know, you can still say what you see and you don't have to be doing an in-depth assessment on attachment because you can't do that because like you just said, you're not qualified, but it 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 shouldn't stop you from observing things and just talking about like basically like you said behavior and I think and the relationship big... dynamic you know you're yeah, talking yeah, about that's the it. dynamic it's... of what you're seeing yeah, that definitely. availability that reliability dependability you know those yeah. needs being met all of that language I think a lot of the time social workers are using language which does very much link in with attachment it's just they haven't got that label behind it which isn't necessarily a bad thing yeah. um but yeah I think it's it's all there it's just it, as a framework it just really kind of helps you to bring together that um, the quality of what that relationship is and isn't. Mm. And that's a huge part of the job, isn't it? <laughs> Definitely. I think one of the things, this wasn't one of my questions, but one of the things that I've thought about more, which shamefully I didn't think about at the start of my career, was some of the systemic implications of using attachment theory. So using attachment theory without thinking about colonization without thinking about anti-racism and um a, a director called Wabria King came on the podcast and talked about black perspectives on attachment and actually how you can't detach history of enslavement and separation of mothers and babies through that process from talking about attachment now and sort of the the family narratives and, and the history and the history of that trauma and it's something that I reflect on much more now about how problematic it is and, and was for me as a social worker to observe some family relationships without even considering just the white ignorance of not even considering the impact of that and I yeah. wonder how training around attachment is changing in response to that yeah and it's not something I know a lot about and really how how we can decolonize attachment theory mm -hmm. I think it's 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 definitely started happening within probably only within the last three four years um, but I'm definitely seeing a difference in terms of you know, at conferences that I've attended where people are trying to put this on the agenda. People are trying to bring in these ideas and merge these ideas and make people more, much more aware of it's not that we're changing what we already know, but we're, we're needing to it's needing to be added to. And attachment theory has always been like that. It's, it's grown massively since the 1960s anyway. And the great thing about it is I think it has that flexibility to do that. It's not rigid and fixed and set and it does invite in other perspectives. And a huge part of it anyway is about zoning into seeing somebody as an individual and what has been their life experiences what has been their generational traumas and how might that be impacting um them now as an individual an individual but then also what becomes their more instinctive natural parenting abilities and again just thinking more widely about culture in general that is something we also need to be making sure that we are considering but again I feel like the overarching framework of attachment theory lends itself to that but we're only now seeing I think more people actively speaking about it writing about it researching about it 
but it's certainly now more on the agenda than it was 10 years ago which is brilliant and yeah. necessary amazing so the and the last thing just on conscious of time at, in every single one of my podcast episodes I ask people the advice that they would give to their newly qualified self so although you're a doctor and not a social worker I wonder if you would go back to maybe starting as a family support worker and the advice that you would give to yourself then um right okay so <clears throat> I think I would probably say you're actually you're exactly where you need to be like and just keep going um and the where you are is going to grow your passion to get get you further and plot twist you will actually do a PhD and you will actually <laughs> complete it my uh yeah my 21 year old self at that point would be like absolutely not no way but um yeah I actually yeah it's that's what I'd be saying I think sometimes at that age as well you just worry that you don't have it all together and you're not necessarily in a place that where you see that you're permanently going to be yeah. Um, and that can feel quite overwhelming. And it did for me. I just felt like I was having a bit of a stopgap of what I was doing. But um, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason and everything happens at the right time for you. And that is how hopefully things have have panned out. I and mean, I'm still not I'm still not 100 percent where I even want to be with the impact I want to have. But um, yeah, but I would say that 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 beginning journey, that work in, in child protection was com was exactly what I needed and it kind of completely put me in another direction where I think I'm kind of much more um doing much more than I would if I just saw families you know in an office it's a completely different setup to what yeah. I'm able to do now and being in people's homes and um and, and the, the link with social work so yeah everything happens for a reason keep going you actually get a PhD so um welcome to the podcast Vicky, social work successes. Um, if you want to just start by giving a little bit of an overview of your maybe previous um, and current role and how long you've been practicing, don't worry about saying teams that you've the actual team that you worked in because we're going to be talking yeah. about specifics of families. So just the area that 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 you um that you've been in and in in, in, in practice. Yes. So I qualified as a social worker through a master's. So before that worked in care, residential care homes for adults with life limiting illnesses. And before that I did a degree in drama and theater arts. So I worked with adults who lived in, well, were homeless and were accessing resources and around drama groups um, for people who are affected by homelessness. I moved from that into social work and my final placement was in a child protection team. So I then went straight into working in child protection and I've worked across duty and assessment, child protection, care proceedings, and then as a child protection conference chair. And whilst doing all that, I was always working with students, always working with newly qualified social workers. And post COVID, I started to, I had an idea that I wanted to write a guide. That's where it started from. And one of my friends said, well, why don't you start on social media, start on Instagram, see if that's something that people are interested in. And so I started to share posts about social work. And although there were a lot of people in the US doing that at the time, it wasn't really a thing that I'd seen a lot of UK social workers do. And the more that I posted, the more people were connecting with the how to, you know, how do you start a home visit? how do you enter somebody's house how do you explain what a social worker does how do you talk about an assessment how do you complete an assessment and mm -hmm. I always wish I had like a more exciting story of how social work sort of started but it really just grew a little bit more organically and I started to realize that there was a massive gap probably post-covid as well because a lot of students and new social workers had not had the in-person placement or ASYE experience everything went virtual chairing meetings in person it was it was like a brand new thing for a lot of people so a lot of the skills that I managed to see shadow and experience on my placement social workers in practice weren't necessarily having that and so I started to kind of and that's divine timing is it not yeah and I think it would have been it maybe would have been 
similar anyway because even now social workers we're, we're back to normal whatever normal mm. is and even now new social workers are still accessing it so I think it was probably always a gap and maybe it became bigger for mm. a while and then yeah because of training programs austerity capacity of local authorities the gap is is still there although I think there are lots of positive changes um but then I started to run I started the podcast because posting on a little Instagram square it kind of wasn't enough to help somebody the way I thought they might need and I love podcasts so and my brother had a podcast and he was like why don't you start one and then it grew started to have guests on it started to run master classes so essentially webinars I'd post about this the other day that it, we now have this language of social work master class mm-hmm. and I um, worked with somebody who was trying to help me with like growing a business and she said, why don't you do a masterclass? And I was like, I've never seen that before, really, for social workers. But t- started that in essentially supporting people in more in-depth social work skills. And things grew from there. Published the guide that I was talking about. Published more courses. Started a membership for social workers. Start, created an accredited training. And, and I still, last year was the first year that I solely worked on social work sorted without having a full-time job as well um but I have a really amazing community of social workers who love to learn and want learning but you definitely do um, and that that shines through I think on on what you're posting and the people engaging with it and your Instagram it's brilliant so check it out everybody (laughs) thank you no it is and it's I guess it's it's remembering like social workers and people who social workers who enter the profession are really busy they're really overwhelmed but they want to learn and they want to be best like the best social workers that they possibly can be and I suppose sometimes I think I'm not really saying anything new maybe it's how I'm saying it or how I'm putting it and that although I'm not in practice at the moment I still remember that really vividly the Mm -hmm. things that were really difficult that I I didn't read in a book anywhere the tiny nuances of stepping into somebody's home or whether you take your shoes off or you don't and all those little things that I suppose take up so much space in your brain it's then really hard to do the other things like observations of attachment or you know relationships so I guess my goal is to free some of that brain space for social workers so they can do the bits of the job that they really love but then the next step from that is so they can maybe start and have the energy to challenge some of the bigger structures because that's often what aligns with their values as well. So that's yeah. how I arrived here. <laughs> Brilliant. What a great explanation. No, that's that's I'm sure really inspiring for other people to hear as well, you know, that where from where you started and what you've managed to to grow. It's brilliant. Um, okay, so today then we're just going to be talking very briefly about a family that you worked with, um, which you would consider uh, the piece of work that you did, your your engagement with them to have been um, successful in some way. So could you just start with a very brief kind of overview of that family, but obviously keeping it anonymous in terms of names and things? Yeah, so I'm going to probably be the vaguest I've ever been because I'm conscious that a lot of my information and and things are are in the public domain I'm I'm going to start with like working backwards of why I think it was a success and it's the one thing it's one thing that has stuck with me since it happened and I always fall back to and it was a moment where I went on a visit with this family And the day before we had been in court and I had given evidence as part of proceedings in relation to the children. And the next, because of lots of other things, the the care proceedings were paused. And the next day I had a visit due with that family. And the parent let me in and we did the visit. And it's always stuck with me because I I thought, God, I, you know, you were there yesterday. You watched me give evidence, talk about things, you know, relating to you and your family and your children. And you've let me into your house. <laughs> and it just, you know, one of the, it just really, 
and it still sticks with me and I still think about it all the time and I think about it like as I have children and just the yeah and there's obviously a power dynamic there which I've thought mm. about a lot you know it was a, a statutory visit that had to happen but it was it wasn't resistant we we managed to sit down we talked about what happened we talked about the care proceedings we we continued our relationship as it as it had been and although it's not it's not like a beginning end and you know beginning middle end story Mm -hmm. that still feels to me like one of the like really significant moments in in my career and it wasn't it's not all it's not like I did this amazing thing and that's why I was let in but I suppose I've had other situations and seen other situations where care proceedings just completely break down relationships and it's no surprise that they do because of that it's horrible for everybody involved mm-hmm. and so for me that is sort of a, a story that I go over a lot and I come back to a lot yeah I, I think it's such a bizarre situation that in any other setting you would never experience that with you would never be giving evidence kind of presumably it was against them in the sense of um recommending um Mm. removal you would never have to do that in another setting of going to court then suddenly be inside the home of the person that you were giving evidence against I mean in terms of how like the just the the stress and the dynamic of that relationship it just really captures doesn't it the expectations on social workers and the the relationships that they're having to manage which are completely out of the norm um and I I've often had this thought actually when I worked in um the local authority I think some of the best social workers that I've worked with they have had that they they it's almost as if they have explained their reasons behind it in in behind their recommendation for removal in such a kind of clear and I don't know how to describe it but it's still been focused around that parent it's still been like but but managed to get them to to really be able to mentalize and see ultimately why they've made that decision through the eyes of their child and Mm. I think when you can do that it does add another element and some people aren't ready to hear that they're not ready to take on that perspective but I think though like because I've been in situations where social workers have we've been you know in the community and they've seen a family whose children have been removed And they've actually been, you know, been amicable with them and engaged with them and asked them how they are and things like that. And it's just quite a bizarre situation to ever find yourself in. But I think it is absolutely about the that relationship based skill and how how those um, ideas and analysis is is put forward in in a way that's so child centered that it becomes quite difficult for um, for that defensive denial to kick in which I think is what is the cause often of um the more kind of um difficult behaviors or challenging behaviors so going back to that story I guess what would you say contributed do you think to them not just you know telling you to not come in and they weren't weren't going to let you in and just kind of that that visit not happening what do you think had I guess maybe in terms of thinking about relationship-based skills Mm -hmm. that that other people I think <clears throat> I'd, I'd always been honest from the start I'd always talked about how difficult things would be I'd always just said the things I was worried about without dressing it up in any fancy language mm-hmm. and I would always say you know you might you're probably not going to agree with this but I need to tell you this so there would never been any surprises they you know because I I think the worst thing for a family must be and I can only imagine reading a document that says so many things that they haven't heard read seen before Mm -hmm. and so but for me by the time it got to that point of them having to read a document it wasn't new because I'd already explained it and I can't imagine how horrendous it must be to read some of those things but the the fact that they had heard those things before I think probably contributed to the fact that it wasn't um there you know there weren't as many surprises and I think again when you know every parent 
part and weirdly enough actually this is from that training that I did with David Shemmings that however many years ago but I remember him saying like the majority of parents love their children it is the very very small percentage where that harm will be you know the the horrendous and cruel and, and intentional mm. harm um but the majority of parents love their children that's uh, that's always stuck with me and I believe it to be true and so something that I always say to new social workers is just like don't be afraid to talk about parents strengths you can make you can be making you know what the worst you know a recommendation that's for whatever reason it's not safe for that child to be in their family situation but you can also talk about the really lovely moments that you they have together with their parents because they do have them mm -hmm. and you can talk about that parents strengths and you can talk about the good things and I think sometimes social workers in court frame that you know when we frame things in care proceedings as win or lose and that's culturally how they're framed and what I say to new social workers is when you're in care proceedings nobody wins nobody it's horrendous it's horrendous mm -hmm. for everybody and even if you get the outcome that you've intended which maybe you know that outcome could be a child is removed from everything that they know to be true and placed with a stranger and even though that might be the safest thing that's not a win and it's not the end. There is a, a whole other second part of, of the story that happens there. And um, and I think when things are framed in that win or lose, sometimes social workers feel, well, the only way I can get the outcome that I think is the safest is for me to be hypercritical of this parent. And I can't, you know, if I say anything good, then their counsel mm -hmm. will pick up on it. And, and then I'm gonna be in this dilemma and I just don't believe that's the case. And, at the end of the day it's just, my job as a social worker is to is to show that balance and I think because I did yeah. and I didn't I said it because I believed it you know there were so many amazing qualities of the the this parent um and that, that parent had had their own life experience as well I think that probably contributed to being able to maintain to an extent that relationship and again, some of it is about power as well. It's, you know, it wasn't an equal relationship to begin with. And I, I don't ever want to give this perception that, oh, it was just, I was so good at building relationships because you can't ignore the the pressure on a parent when they're in care proceedings. You know, if they think, well, if I don't let the social worker in, you, what's then going to happen to other children in the family or whatever it is? Um but yeah, I would say it was not having any surprises, being honest and, and being honest about the strengths as well. Yeah, I think those are yeah really brilliant things for other people to to hear. I mean, picking up on the not having any surprises thing, when I did my um my research for my PhD, that was a huge theme that came from when I talked to the parents about their relationship with social workers, you know, just wanting and like craving that honesty from the beginning, knowing that those messages and what's going to be said is not going to be easy to hear, but wanting mm. to hear it as soon as possible. And like you said, not having a sense of like going into a meeting where suddenly something's said in front of lots of other people that's new and actually hearing that information on a one-to-one in their own home it's very different yeah. feeling to hearing it in front of professionals or or hearing it in a courtroom so it sounds like that's exactly why that hearing as horrific as it is for everyone involved it wasn't new information and it, that's not downplaying it for them but if it had been I think it that then that that you know that following visit probably wouldn't have played out mm -hmm. in the same way and and you you will have explained those things and you can explain those things in a in a conversation very different to you can written down in a report so yeah. so that, that yeah is incredibly um I I important and and yeah, that that information is is not new and that that honesty is is there um okay so I guess the last thing I'm going to ask you is um what do you love most about your job um what I love most about I, I guess go I'll go back to because it's kind of a different job now but hmm. when I was in the kind of front frontline child protection don't always like the word frontline because it's like army speak isn't it um but when I was in child protection what I loved most is just like being with families <laughs> I like I loved um building those relationships I loved being able to 
like be kind to people which probably sounds really cheesy but like you know it's nice to hear nice things about yourself and and I think I realized this more when I became a parent as well because I was probably a very different social worker before but being able to normalize some things for parents mm -hmm. and being able to say well do you know you might be struggling because of this this and this like it's not just you there's other things happening around you being able we, when you're in the situations with people you can say that you know this isn't your fault Th those moments when you think probably no one else has said it to, th to that person before um mm -hmm. you know working with women where there's been a domestic abuse to be able to to help them to understand the you know it's not their fault and actually it's the other person's behavior and being able to advocate and say it, it's that person's behavior and I, I actually as a conference chair I I wouldn't say I enjoyed it but one of the satisfact this most satisfying part of the job was being able to be in a meeting and being able to challenge that on slightly wider scale so to say you know we're not talking about that in mum's part you know where the perpetrator was was a, a male and a dad I'd say we're not talking about that in in mum's part of the meeting because she's not responsible for that part of the behavior and to be able to shift that perspective um yeah was was part of the job that I really liked I suppose it so it's it's probably something about changing minds and introducing new ideas to people who maybe hadn't had those ideas before um and, and it sounds thing. like having those relationships, you know, being able to have that kind of relationship, it's, it's a privilege that it's work, but that you are actually having that kind of impact through, um, through the relationship that you are able to have with someone saying things to them, they've probably never heard anyone say before. Yeah, yeah. Being parent focused is being child focused. I say that quite a lot. You can't have one or the other. Like if you really want to get to the bottom of what's going on with a child, you've got to have that, try your best to build that relationship um, with, um, with the parent. So yeah, it sounds like that was a big, big part of the way in which you were practicing. Yeah. Um, I did. And I will go back into it because I think there's only so long you can sort of teach and train for without then doing. And I yeah. never, it, and it's not, it shouldn't be worn like a, you're not saying like, oh, look at me, I've never been burnt out because of, my career has been so different and I've had like breaks and maternity. But I, I've, I didn't leave practice because I'd had enough. It just happened that I just couldn't physically do two jobs at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, which is a positive it's a nice to be able to to know that that's not why I said goodbye for a little while to you know working as a conference chair and and going back into social work and I know things are really different depending on what local authority that you're in um but I think nice yeah. people to hear that I think sometimes I was talking with some, about this with my partner who's a teacher he's going to be leaving teaching and you can I think social work is the same you can get a bit indoctrinated where you feel like this is where you need to be now for the rest of your life until you retire but yeah. actually you know, there are other opportunities and things to do and certainly if you're getting to that place where you're almost feeling that burnout then being able to think about where your skill set um, fits and all the skills that I mean social work will naturally bring you in so many skills when you're going to be able to you're going to be building yeah. and learning and everything else so there's you, you've got a lot to bring I think and it's you're a great example I think to show people that you can branch out and you can use your skills and you can certainly help other people um, within you. the profession too great thanks. okay thanks very much Vicky thank you so much